The first offseason of the Saints franchise on Madden 24 is now in the books. I'll be recapping the three-hour live stream from last week, giving you everything that happened in the offseason, all of our moves, all of our draft picks, and a lot of stuff that happened post-stream with undrafted free agency and everything. So if you don't have time or want to watch a three-hour stream where I take forever to do everything, I totally get it. That's why I make these videos to recap and keep everybody who wants a shorter experience a part of the loop here. If I remember, I'll link the stream and you can watch it if you want, but you definitely don't need to to stay up to date on the series. I think we all knew this was going to be a really interesting offseason, given the state of this roster, the age and financial situation. I really focused on the defense going into things, knowing that we have a lot of old veterans there and we don't really have a young core to build around. Marshawn Lattimore is now 28 years old. We don't have a lot of draft picks. We didn't have a lot of cap space. Cam Jordan already retired after the season. So I did a lot preparing for the offseason in the recap video and I shared a lot of what I thought would happen. And that included the possibilities of trading Michael Thomas and Marcus May to help us recoup some picks and also shed some salary. The 2025 cap hits already looked really dangerously high in a lot of areas, so I thought that the first two years of this series would be quite the challenge. We had around, I think, 22 expiring free agents on this team, but there was only one that I really wanted to keep around, and that was Cesar Ruiz. Star dev, young, solid average starting guard. I'm down with that, especially at around five to six million dollars a season. We offered and he accepted a three year extension. I wanted the multiple years partially because it would help us with restructuring. Then I didn't offer any more contracts. Most of these players weren't interested in coming back and I'm really looking forward to adding my own players to be depth and develop, so a lot of these players just didn't fit into our plans, and I withdrew every single offer here. One issue Madden has is with the undrafted contracts. Players like Rashid Shahid really should have had a, another year on the deal. He was a free agent, even though he won't be in real life for probably a couple years, honestly. So he was set to hit free agency. I had interest in him coming back. But I knew that would be a little bit of a challenge. We got to the offseason, took a look here at Michael Thomas and Marcus May, wanted to put those guys on the trade block. I really want to start transitioning this roster to being a little bit younger, and we just need the draft picks really badly. And both of these contracts were actually our most tradable, I thought. Checking out free agency to see who is out there. You got players like Tyron Smith and the Chargers had to get under the cap and they released Keenan Allen and Mike Williams to do so. So they're out there. Stephon Gilmore, just a bunch of players we're not going to have any ability to sign at all because we don't have the money and I'm not signing like 33 year old free agents here. I'm trying to build for the future with this roster. So we had to approach free agency very differently than I typically would. And I wanted to look primarily at defense. Like edge rusher was a big need. Safety was uh, a consideration there. And I was even thinking about backup quarterback until the chat reminded me, like, I don't really need to. Last year, the Saints drafted Jake Hayner in the fourth round. And I didn't think about him much because he wasn't even our backup. Jameis Winston was. But he was also on the injured reserve in game because he was suspended for a banned performance enhancing substance. Well, now I think he's ready to be our backup and has the perfect like skill set there. Just short accuracy, a little mobility. So we're not going to be signing a quarterback here. Instead, I realized that we were going to have to go and make some cap space if we were going to do a whole lot. And I started off by going to James Hurst. And he's a 73 overall guard who didn't have any uh, trade interest from teams. And we were able to free up $3 million there. Tano Passigno, 30-year-old edge rusher, about a 68 overall. We can free up at least a little bit there. And then I consider the players who I thought to be actually tradable. And I said right off the bat, like for, for realism purposes here, I'm not going to accept anything that is greater than a fourth round pick for these guys because I think that 
you know, a four or later is about fair. And the Vikings gave us an offer from Marcus May. And uh, I wasn't interested in their offer, but I wanted to do business with them. And we did trade Marcus May to the Vikings for a fourth and a future seventh round pick. This means that rookie from Minnesota, oddly enough, Jordan Howden, could be slotted to start depending on how the offseason went, adding a potential safety. We then looked at Michael Thomas, and I decided that we would look to trade him to Sean Payton and the Denver Broncos. And we offered Michael Thomas for a fourth round pick, and they accepted. So a couple extra picks for this season, and some money is opened up. And A.T. Perry's been the player I thought could take over for Michael Thomas. Had some moments last year. Does have good short route running. I think Perry's got a lot of potential if we can get him a lot of uh, volume this season. This gave us $18.5 million in cap space. And we still had to fill, you know, like 10 roster spots or so using the draft and free agency. Actually, probably more than 10. First thing I did is offer a contract here, a small one to Rashid Shahid to see if we could get him to return because I like his skill set as a role player. But looking at the defensive side, I was looking for players that still were like 25, 26 years old and were more like second chance deals. So the Lions ended up releasing James Houston, who had eight sacks as a rookie, didn't really do a whole lot for them a year ago, but he became available with star dev at 25 years old. Really fortunate this situation came about. We offered him a multi-year contract. The other player that I thought fit what we were looking for is AJ Epinesa from the Buffalo Bills. 25 years old. And what I like about Epinesa is that he's kind of a big edge who can also play a little bit inside. It's like a light version of the Cam Jordan skill set, who's also very versatile. And now he's retired. Then at wide receiver, I knew I couldn't just replace Thomas and have our receiving core be Chris Olave and then a bunch of inexperienced players. I've always been a Josh Reynolds guy. He was available. I thought he'd be a pretty solid player here to pursue, and we offered him about a $3 million contract. I also wanted to look at offensive line depth, and one thing I want to do a better job of in my series is like, Let's actually have a backup center, a backup guard, and not just like throw guys at whatever position. So I offered a contract to Evan Brown. And those were my five targets here in the first wave. Not the biggest names, not the flashiest offers or anything, and nobody accepted my initial offers. I was trying to be a little cheap here, okay? I don't have a lot of cap space to spend, so I was lowballing guys and trying to see if I could get players to accept smaller contracts, knowing it would probably not be all that effective. The Falcons have been really active, though, in free agency, and they go after Tyron Smith and Stephon Gilmore. They want to keep this grip they have on the NFC South after last year, and they spent a lot of money in doing so. Carl Granderson is gone. Now he goes to the Steelers. We couldn't really afford to keep him around. And we did up our offers then for our five targets once again. And we evaluate these offers, and we have our first accepted deal. We have signed James Houston the fourth. And he will be in uh, a competition, basically, to be a starting edge rusher. We'll talk about position battles and everything later on. AJ Epinesa also accepts the deal. So right away, we do add a couple edge rushers, and that was a very high priority of mine. But I still had interest as well in adding an edge in the NFL draft. It was just kind of funny to approach free agency this way, but... It was working. Josh Reynolds accepted the deal, and I thought he had a chance to be a starting receiver or at least play a decent bit. With the beginning of free agency out of the way, it was time to start thinking a little bit more about the NFL draft. I came into the offseason thinking that trading down and maybe out of the first round was our best option, but I really wanted to focus on the defensive players early. We were mocked to take a wide receiver in Kentrell Samuel. Receiver is something I did have interest in addressing in the first couple rounds. And then I had to consider as well, what about quarterback? Because Chad Watkins was projected to be there for us. 
and I thought he was a good prospect, albeit a very injury-prone prospect. Good short accuracy, a little mobility, very strong arm, but I really didn't like the injury risk, and I really wanted to fix up more of the roster this offseason and look to add a quarterback later. I thought he was a good prospect, but not like a can't miss. I was okay passing on him this year. We ended up getting our targets there outside of Shahid when it came to free agency. And I looked around for some other players, but felt like we were probably better off just waiting to see how the draft unfolded for anything else. So free agency wasn't really all that exciting. We did also bring back Lonnie Johnson Jr. for some safety depth, but it was time to focus primarily now on the draft. Wide receiver was still something I wanted to think about, but edge rusher and defense in general. I'm trying to build a core there and find the young players we can build around for the future. Gotta add more corners, although I like the three that we have a lot. And at safety, we had the option of just going into the season with who we had, but Jordan Howden was a fifth round rookie last year, didn't play a whole lot. He did get one start. There were a lot of ways you could approach this offseason and a lot of positions that had to be addressed. So, Kentrell Samuel was mocked to us, and I really liked what I saw. Athletically, he runs a 4-4, moves really well, gets off the line with B-release, a catch in traffic, B-short route running. There's a ton to like here. So, I wanted to finish the profile on him and then look at a couple of defensive players as well in the first couple rounds. So I did like Paul Browning. I had 95% of the info on him. Athletically, looks overall good, just not great acceleration, but A, power moves, B, block shed, A, awareness. I really like players like Paul Browning. And then there was JoJo Sharp as well. I thought maybe if we could get into that third round range, that's where we could look to attack for a safety. So... I ended up picking my three private workout players, and we did get the profile done on Kentrell Samuel, which revealed he was actually more of a second to third round talent. I looked at his, you know, athleticism and his skills. I still liked a lot of what I saw, but I realized he probably wouldn't be a first round target of ours now, not at 19. But for some reason, I guess this still hasn't been fixed where I picked those players I wanted to get the info on, Tommy Tomlinson, JoJo Sharp, and I just didn't get anything. So I kind of got screwed out of the private workouts. We don't get that extra information, but now it's all we can do ahead of the NFL draft. Here we go with the Minnesota Vikings picking number one overall. We came into the draft with now two fourth round picks, helping fill in some of the gaps here, but still just two picks in the top 100. I felt like free agency went pretty well. We did get some players who can compete for playing time in the front seven. We got extra picks. There wasn't a lot we could do, but I thought we managed our very little resources pretty well but knew that the draft was, it was gonna be really key for us to come away with some difference makers that can help us early. The team needs it right now. So the draft unfolds. Number one, the Minnesota Vikings select Wake Forest defensive end Isaiah Younger. Edge rusher obviously was a high priority of mine and the draft unfolded going edge rusher, edge rusher edge rusher one after another i think one of these players was actually more of a defensive tackle but nonetheless it's just front seven players flying off the board six straight until the patriots go offensive line and then we're right back to players in the front seven and we're sitting there at 19 realizing that we might end up having to take like the seventh or eighth edge rusher if that's the route we're gonna go it's just the way things unfolded. The first skill player didn't go until 12 when the Dolphins took Kirk McKee, a tight end out of Notre Dame. No quarterbacks, no receivers, no safeties. Now a safety. Kevin Parker goes to the Denver Broncos and the Lions are happy taking the number one corner in Mike Cleary. There was absolutely no way we were going to trade up this year. Raiders go DJ Morant. There's a wide receiver off the board. And the Bears go defensive tackle John Hernandez. The Eagles take Devontae Sims, 
who did not go to Georgia. And then the Bears with their second of two first round picks actually go Ken Trill Samuel. So all these edge rushers are gone. Samuel's a little bit overdrafted. We're sitting here at 19. Feeling like the board didn't really fall in a favorable way for us. We could go quarterback. We could go in a lot of different directions, but I wasn't really excited about the prospects of picking here at 19. If the roster was in uh, a slightly different state, I think there actually would have been some fits here, but I felt like staying at 19 wasn't going to be our best option. And looking at the edge rushers, I knew that if I moved down and still wanted to get an edge, it's going to be really tricky. And it doesn't feel good to sit here in the middle of the first round and possibly take, you know, barely a top 10 player at a certain position. Quincy Cummings and Paul Browning were still available. Two edge rushers that I did like, but they both came with injury issues. And Browning at 95%, we didn't know his true talent. I'd like to know for my first rounders most of the time. But I felt like Browning would at least be a really solid player. But also maybe a player you could get if after trading down a little bit. Dalton Irwin, not the best athlete, but power and run stopping skill. I did like that. Let's just look at our trade down offers. We knew this was going to be coming. And I ended up seeing an offer from the Minnesota Vikings that was really intriguing. They were offering us... Their second round pick falling down, you know, 14 spots, but picking up next year's second, third, sixth, and a future seventh round pick. That would give us a full allotment of picks and really help out the 2025 offseason. The issue, though, is it would do nothing for us this year. And we do need to address a lot of needs right now. So in an average year, I'd be all over the Vikings offer, but I couldn't. It kind of hurt not taking that deal, but the Packers offered us a better alternative, I thought. Falling down five spots, getting a three this year, which we don't have a third, and a seven. So I took the Packers' offer as they moved up for a defensive back, as the Packers do. Dominic Strickland's safety goes to Green Bay. So now we got to see what unfolds between there and 25, and Quincy Cummings goes to the Rams. Another edge, no longer an option. The Titans at 22, Paul Browning. And Browning was one of my favorite options here. Thought he could have been a day one starter. And now, how many edges have gone in this first round? We're on the clock at 25, and now Dalton Irwin is perhaps the best edge available. I do like the skills. A power, A block shed, you can't go higher than an A grade. But I didn't feel like he was going to be one of those like cornerstone players. He didn't have the athleticism. And I ended up looking in a completely different direction. Going a little bit more best player available. And Tommy Tomlinson has been one of my favorites this entire year. Although 50% scouted, I felt like I had enough information to make him the first pick of this series. And he is a hidden development corner. He is six foot four with excellent speed and man cover ability. So I only had 50%, but I had enough info because he had the speed, obviously. He had good press ability and B zone coverage with man to man archetype. So although his range there was A to C man coverage, I knew it wasn't going to be a C, otherwise, he'd be a zone archetype corner. So we end up drafting at a position of strength and not necessarily one of our greatest needs. At the top of the second round, the Vikings end up taking Chad Watkins, staying put, not moving up or sacrificing all those picks. They get the first quarterback of the draft. And the Colts after them go Niles Bayless, a safety that I had a lot of interest in. And the Buccaneers go Jason Tracy. And it looks like he's going to be a day one starter. So we're going to get to know the Buccaneers rookie quarterback. Here in the second round, Elton Daniels goes to the Patriots. It was a really good tight end class. That was another way to bolster the offense possibly, but the tight ends were just going in ranges we couldn't really compete with. 
So we end up here at 13 in the second round after the Dolphins went tight end receiver to start their draft. And I didn't feel good about the wide receiver spot now. Ideally, I thought a second round receiver would be great, like focus on defense, but sneak a receiver in there in the second round. And with uh, Samuel gone, that wasn't an option. The coldest Huff, I only had 50% and he felt like a really risky prospect. The tight end still had some intriguing ability, but my favorite two options were gone and... I just didn't feel like the tight end spot was the right call in this area. There were some offensive linemen that I liked, and I felt like we could still look to add a, a starting guard after releasing James Hurst. We didn't add anybody along the offensive line. We only lost players. But Luke Rowe was one of those players that you scout, and you're like, all right, I'm going to find a way to get this guy, even if I have to draft a round or two early. Just way too good athletically, not injury prone, good pass protector. And then also at safety, Devontae Compton looks like a really good fit for what I want to do. I need versatile safeties. Compton's very versatile. And then James Bolden, another excellent athlete whose talent is far above his projection, a slam dunk. Although at like a less valuable spot, you know, off ball linebacker with, uh, you know, B zone coverage, C man coverage, and that's an outside backer. But I still felt like Bolden would be a good pick here in the second round because we need that Demario Davis replacement. And I felt like if he had the athleticism, he would be able to develop the coverage over time with everything else looking promising. So we start the draft with a corner and a linebacker and then immediately wanted to find a way to move up because there were still more targets that I liked and the price was just not right here in the second round as the Titans take Devontae Compton they end up with two players that I liked a lot defensively and then Kansas City ends up taking the Heisman Trophy winning running back Shaq Patterson out of uh, Clemson and the Jaguars go Jojo Sharp with my board shrinking, I knew I had to be somewhat aggressive if I wanted to get the guys I really valued in this draft. So trying to move up here with the Detroit Lions. They play a little hardball. I have to give up a four and a five, but we do jump up in the third round. And we end up going Luke Rowe. With that athleticism, I felt like this guy is going to have hidden development, especially seeing the A pass block finesse. Sure enough, hidden development and a day one caliber starting left guard. Pretty happy getting three hidden dev players to start our drafting. Still having some picks left to fill other needs, but I knew that some of these spots might be difficult to fill. Wide receiver, for instance, I had three players on the entire board and they were all very different players, but Jacoby Pierman to me... We need that Rashid Shahid replacement. And who doesn't want a receiver that runs 4-2 with a deep route running and a spec catch? You can find a way to make some plays with a guy like that. And then also thinking about Tyrell Stoudemire. I know we don't need corner, but he's six foot five, and I already know he has a man, a press, and he's projected to go on day three. So it doesn't matter what my depth chart looks like. I want to get him. Jonathan Columbus also at safety, I felt, could uh, be one of those hybrid players and have a, a starting caliber upside on day one. So I had options here. I ended up uh, waiting around here a little bit with Columbus going to the Cardinals. We didn't pick again until middle of the fourth round, and we waited all the way until that pick came around. And the board still looked pretty good. But to me, Stoudemire, we're not passing any longer. Normal development, but that's about the only normal thing about him. He's six foot five at cornerback with 91 speed and he can press. We are looking to build a true identity for this defense. And we just drafted the two biggest corners in the draft who both have a lot of upside. We moved up in the fifth round with the Houston Texans. No longer having a seventh round pick because we want to add Jacoby Pierman out of Texas Tech, 98 speed, 98 acceleration. Yeah, I think we can find a way to work with that. But the draft was starting to wrap up. Not a whole lot more we can do. 
Didn't draft an edge rusher, didn't draft a receiver, didn't draft a safety. So in the sixth round, we were going to address at least one of those spots, and Chester Hayward had uh, still pretty good athleticism, I felt, for players in this range, and he will add to our edge rush competition. Oh, but we're not quite done yet. Here in the sixth round, we trade down and actually acquire an additional seventh round pick in 2024. And once we trade down, we then selected a punter in Jack Becker. Didn't have a punter, and now we do on a cheap sixth round contract for four years. And that brought us to the end of the NFL draft. Here are the player ratings. 77 for Tommy Tomlinson. The first five players all 70 or above. A lot of upside and potential here in this draft. Tommy Tomlinson, 22 years old out of Florida. I'm sure we're going to find a way to get him on the field early. His skills are phenomenal. And this is going to help us a lot when it comes to thinking about what happens after, you know, Marshawn Lattimore's deal is up. Then we go James Bolden. I do think in the second round you could have gone a lot of ways, but when you have just a need to acquire talent, and we knew Bolden had first round talent with great athleticism, it just kind of was, uh, you know, you could go and hit a double, maybe not a home run, but you can get on base. We knew it would be a good pick. But Luke Rowe, a day one starting guard, big help for the offense. Tyrell Stoudemire, fifth cornerback. About the best fifth cornerback I've ever seen. So this gives us options too at the position in terms of trading and how we want to handle that position in the future. Jacoby Pierman. You got to get this guy the ball. He's electric. However, 67 catching is a concern. And we checked. He does not have running back skills at all. He's a receiver who does have catching issues. Chester Hayward. We'll see if his finesse and athleticism can benefit us early. We have a lot of playing time up for grabs. And then punter Jack Becker. That accuracy concerns me because, you know, Headley's accuracy wasn't good last year and he couldn't down kicks inside the 10 very easily. We'll see what Jack can do. But I really like the way we had uh, attacked this draft. You know, it, it wasn't typical for me. A lot of times I'm a little more need oriented, but I look at the state of this roster and I realize we're just kind of in talent acquisition mode. We just need to go get really high upside players and let things fall into place over time because we're not a Super Bowl team this year. We weren't last year. We got to rebuild this and hopefully do it the right way. Now, all these edge rushers went super early. A lot of them had hidden development. And then we go to the tight end spot, Kirk McKee. Another big-time playmaker here in the Dolphins offense. Should be interesting to see how they develop. Kentrell Samuel went before we picked in the first round, and although he had second to third round talent, that feels almost misleading. I think his skills are really good. He's a good athlete at the same time. I don't think that's a bad pick for the Bears. Paul Browning. We missed out on him because of our trade down. He's not like a dynamic athlete, but he brings a lot to the table, and he's a versatile player. I really like him. He was injury prone, though, so I'm okay in the direction we ended up going. And with Quincy Cummings, we also knew injuries were a concern with him. So you've got good players, a lot of good edge rushers there early on, but very few complete packages, a lot of injury concerns. The Vikings took Chad Watkins. And I think they did a pretty good job with this pick. He is a little injury prone. We'll see how their offense comes together this year. But the Vikings now have uh, their quarterback of the future, they're hoping. The Raiders. Man, this was a good pick. DJ Morant. Maybe the best receiver in the class. That's an awesome pick for them. The Buccaneers took Jason Tracy out of Stanford. He's got a rocket arm. He loves to throw it downfield, but he's a work in progress who's going to have to learn on the job, likely as a day one starting quarterback. The Bills not only signed Gabe Davis in the offseason, but also drafted a player who might end up being a lot better in Montreal Williams. 
The Cardinals did an outstanding job in their class of adding defensive players. Two secondary starters, two edge rushers in the first round. I love the offseason that the Cardinals had. They should be a very different team, especially in a year or two. And the Chargers also did a really good job bolstering a front seven, adding Alex Sampson and then Luke Swinton to defensive linemen, won an interior player. So I love the direction they're going. And the Chiefs, Shaq Patterson, the Heisman Trophy winner, wasn't like a great athlete. He's a big back, runs with power. Some similarities to Clyde edwards Lair, but he really can't catch the football that well. And then to Coldest Tough, who ended up going to the Eagles... Yeah, I mean, you might be able to develop him, but it's just going to take a lot of work and time. There's no guarantee it would work out. I feel like he's a uh, Denzel Mims type of player. Oh, and JoJo Sharp. Remember when I didn't get the info on him? Well, if I did, I'd probably have known that he's exactly what I wanted at the safety position. I had an awesome time during the stream and we had a lot of fun, but there's always more to do afterwards. I want to show you what else has happened to this team and the undrafted players that I've signed. Some of them actually were signed in the stream, but uh, I had a lot more work to do. And one thing I did is a couple restructures. If I didn't do this, I wouldn't have been able to fill out the roster more and give us more undrafted free agents. So I ended up restructuring Eric McCoy's contract, which freed up $6.7 million in additional cap space. And so that cap hit now is spread over the next two years. And I also ended up restructuring for a little extra money, the deal for Cesar Ruiz. Literally, I had to restructure so I could get $860,000. That's how tight things got here. But I wanted to add more UDFAs and those players now get a chance to develop and leave an impression in preseason, obviously. But I think there's actually a lot that needs to sort itself out once we get to preseason. And I'm imagining I'll do some streams this week. And those are always a lot of fun. But I want to go position by position now because I added players at pretty much every spot. And that includes a player who's not a rookie here, but Malik Cunningham joins as the third quarterback. Primarily because if, like, I'm playing with Hayner in the preseason and he gets hurt, I don't want to have to go and throw Carr into the fourth quarter of a preseason game or something so we're gonna have three quarterbacks on the team at least in preseason and then at running back I don't have a lot here but you bet I signed two undrafted free agents so there's first Brian Johnson out of Colorado State 5'5 172 not the fastest guy, but he does catch the football pretty well and he does have good acceleration we're gonna give him a chance along with Alabama's John Waters who is 228 pounds a power back to uh, get some playing time I thought about this one for a while but I also wanted to bring in veteran receiver Jawan Jennings so we did add Josh Reynolds and Jennings has a lot of similarities in his skill set but one thing is he gets a lot better release like five better so I kind of want those two to compete to see who is actually like the best second receiver. This year, I do want to get Perry a lot of playing time. So it's not just going to be Olave, Jennings and Reynolds out there a whole lot. But I, I figured why not at least have them compete a little bit. But I then added two undrafted players. They both have really good size. And here is George Levins. So I brought him in. He's got a pretty good release, not the best athlete, but, uh, you know, there's a little bit to work with here. Some run after the catch skills and he's 68 overall. And then also UCLA rookie Braylon Farrow. And he's got uh, a pretty similar skill set, maybe not as good after the catch, but I like the release and spec catch. I'm trying to get some players here who can take some snaps on the outside. For the offensive line, I actually think some of these undrafted players have a shot of making the roster, but I wanted to make sure like we have a good backup for everybody, so it's just easy to set those backup offensive lines once we get into the those portions of the game. So Manny Golson is a, a backup tackle who's going to have a chance to make the roster, and then we also added Nate Morrison from Wake Forest at 65 overall, and he'll be uh, a backup guard. 
Oh yeah, Jarius Bryant as well. I want to get him some playing time. He is 6'6", 333, and he's a really strong run blocker. Edge Rush is going to give us a huge competition this year. Like anybody here could be a starter when the season gets underway. We do have some defensive tackles here competing to make the team. We have uh, Barry Garland, who's a UDFA, and uh, Jordan Riley. Not a rookie, but he's got run-stopping archetype, 89 strength, 80 block shed, and I'd say there's a fairly good chance he ends up making the team. We'll see about these linebackers. I did add Tyler Rhodes, who is the same overall as DeMarco Jackson, but five years younger. And Rhodes has 85 speed, 82 tackling. He's got run-stopping ability, just can't be trusted in coverage right now. And then Jerry Rayburn from South Carolina, who does have the coverage archetype, although it's not, like, all that impressive, and his speed's only 82, so... We'll see, but a pass coverage player there. Uh, with James Bolden, though, I'm still thinking about how he's going to start his career. Our second round pick has a lot of upside, but he is like our third best linebacker, perhaps, and he doesn't have great cover skills here on day one. So I want to make sure he's out there on special teams all the time and hopefully can uh, rotate in to at least start getting his uh, experience and development because... If we can get that coverage usable, we got ourselves a pretty complete player. I did add a cornerback in Jason Kelly, 6'1", so one of our smallest cornerbacks. But this allows us to play three guys who are not our main starters when we go to the backups, and he is a really good scheme fit. Might have a chance to make our practice squad. And then, surprisingly, I did not really like the safeties for... Uh, the undrafted free agents there weren't a lot there and the ones that were there didn't really fit the archetypes i was looking at so this is our safety situation going into the year it's jordan howden's opportunity right now and we'll see if he can run with it i think that uh, the run stopping i can trust hopefully the coverage you know gets better quickly I know a lot of people are going to suggest that I just play Tommy Tomlinson as a safety. That way, Adebo and Taylor can play, and Tommy's going to be on the field then. You know, I'm kind of tired of, like, moving corners to safety just because of zone coverage being all right. I really want to go away from that, and instead, I'd rather look at, like, moving older corners to safety, and a lot of guys have made that transition. But I don't know that his run defense would actually be good as a safety. You know, 62 tackling. You've got to be able to tackle if you're going to play safety. And he's really a pure cover guy. And uh, we're going to find a way to play him anyway. It's just not going to be at safety. I should also mention, too, I began to start editing some of the player uh, equipment and everything. So an issue with the draft class, at least when the game launched, was that like, everybody had the same basic equipment, which was, like, no equipment. They all had, like, the Sam Bradford sleeve look going on. So I've slowly been editing a lot of these players on our team. And as we uh, go on, I'll probably be editing other teams as well. And when preseason ends, I'll look at editing numbers a bit more in depth. But I am looking to, you know, update equipment and give guys more unique looks and hopefully have that side of the game... Uh, doing well i've also been going through like other teams rosters and i've just been you know if they have too many guys at one position you know like two good guards who should start at left guard i'll even things out for them in a couple places i've actually changed a guy's position entirely like stan culver was drafted as a guard for them a right guard but I look at, you know, 6'4", 316. I think that's good tackle size. He's not like an overly strong guy or anything like that. And uh, I think he'd hold up well at tackle. So I moved him to left tackle where he probably will start right away as opposed to possibly being a backup guard instead and not getting on the field as much. So I've done that for like, uh, I've gone through all the teams to take a look at some things like that. The Eagles drafted a tackle, Devontae Sims. I just moved him to right tackle instead and assuming eventually he'll take over for Lane Johnson. And here is a look at our schedule for this season. And I said during the stream, like 
with the Buccaneers having a uh, second round rookie quarterback, we want to see them on the schedule as early as possible. And we got them opening day. So this season, we're going to take on the AFC West in addition to the Cincinnati Bengals, which gives us a much tougher AFC schedule than we had a year ago when we played the AFC South. We close against the Chargers, which is really not cool. I wish that we'd have a division game there, but I do think it's a much more interesting schedule. And I'd say our team probably won't be quite as good as last year's. We'll see how it all plays out. I know we played a lot of rookie quarterbacks last year, and there was only uh, two quarterbacks, I think, drafted that are going to be starters here this season, and we don't play Minnesota. So we have our two games against the Bucks, And uh, as far as, like, our quarterback schedule, you know, we got Justin Fields here, Russell Wilson, Jimmy Garoppolo. Not the toughest four-game stretch to open. The Falcons did sign Kirk Cousins. So we'll see if he's still starting at uh, week six. And in, uh, yeah, that is kind of weird because they were so successful last year. That just kind of hit me that, like, you know, the Falcons won 12 games, beat us in a playoff game, and they signed Kirko. But Ritter still might have an edge there. We'll see. You know, sometimes I look at team situations and I say, you know, it makes more sense to just play the young guy over the old guy. So if you're going to... You don't want to start somebody who really shouldn't be. I'll just knock their ratings down because I think it makes their team better to play uh, the younger quarterback. In this case, I might actually do that here for the Falcons and push them towards playing Ritter. He's listed as their starter because Kirk is hurt, but I'll take a look at that. They, they view him as a franchise quarterback, so if they don't start him by default, I'm probably going to make him. But here's a look at our roster going into the preseason. The offensive line with all these uh, star dev, you know, situations, that looks pretty promising. We'll see what Roe has after 500 snaps. So the main things I'm looking at are, uh, you know, the wide receiver two and three battle. After Olave, who's able to stand out? Who earns the playing time there? We have a couple veterans, a couple young guys, a couple UDFAs. Should be fun to see how that shakes out. But the offense is so similar to last season. On defense, it's really, you know, the edge rush battle. That's going to be the highlight here. Foskey, you know, in his second year, can he step up? Can James Houston regain that rookie form? And then Jordan Howden, can he start at safety? Is this a good situation or not? And are we able to find some playing time for guys like Tommy Tomlinson? We're going to play Tommy a lot in the preseason, but I could easily see us playing Tommy as the second corner and Adebo as a, a slot and at least getting Tommy playing time as a rookie. But uh, we'll see then if, you know, Alante Taylor is a player that I, you know, want to consider trading or not. He has normal development, can't tackle, but he's a scheme fit and played fairly well for us at times last year. So we'll see. Good problem to have having a lot of cornerbacks that I want to get on the field. Some teams have uh, no good cornerbacks. But that's going to do it for the offseason, everybody. I am excited to get us to the preseason and into year two with the UTSA Dynasty season wrapping up here after um, maybe another week or so. It's going to be all Saints on this channel really for quite some time, and we should get through year two even faster. And I'm really excited to really start this series. You know, year two is when the true kickoff is, and we're here now. So let me know what you thought of the offseason. Do you like the direction I'm taking this team? Please leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and we're on to season two here shortly. Have a great day.